Hi, everyone. I'm Matt Ahrens. Uh, I helped to create the ZFS file system uh, starting back in 2001 uh, at Sun Microsystems. Uh, and I work at Delphix. So I'm going to be talking to you guys today about uh, ZFS allocation performance and some enhancements that uh, I've made to it. OK, so first of all, uh, why are we even talking about this? Um, so whenever ZFS uh, writes anywhere on disk, it has to allocate somewhere on disk to write that to. And it has to be somewhere that is not currently in use. So we have to find some free space to write everything to because ZFS is a copy and write file system. So I'm going to be talking about how ZFS does that and how should it do that. Um, and we'll talk about two uh, problems that, um, that we've addressed with that. So like, why is that so hard? I mean, uh, you just find some free space and you throw it there and like everything's good, right? So as I mentioned, ZFS is copy on write, which means that every time you do a write, even if it's rewriting an existing file, um, we need to find a new place on disk to write it. So we're doing a, a lot of allocations. Um, and ZFS has variable block size. That means that uh, depending on the size of your file and your settings, uh, you could be allocating a block that's 512 bytes or all the way up to 16 megabytes. Uh, and we also support compression, which means that the block could be any multiple of 512. So it could be you know, 7 kilobytes or you know, 32 and a half kilobytes or you know, 1.275 megabytes. Uh, and all of these different allocation sizes mean that fragmentation can become much more of a problem. Uh, there's actually 32,000 uh, possible different sizes of blocks that we might need to allocate. Um, and uh, even if you're, even in the best case where you're still using the default max of uh, 128K and you're using 4K uh, sector size, there's still 32 different sizes, uh, which means that like, if you, al if you allocate a bunch of one uh, you know, size 4K chunks and then free some of them, then we, and then you want to allocate a 128K chunk, we need to find 32 contiguous free slots uh, in order to satisfy that. OK, so uh, first of all, how does ZFS do this at all? Um, so in the beginning was the write system call. So uh, user and applications issue write system calls to make changes to the file system. Um, same kind of thing can come in over NFS, NFS write operation, or iSCSI write operation. Uh, in what we call open context in ZFS, all that we're doing is copying the data that we need to write into memory uh, and saying, great, everything is good. And uh, asterisk, we're talking about uh, asynchronous writes here, synchronous writes. There's some more stuff going on that I'm going to kind of ignore for the purposes of this talk, but it works kind of the same way. Um, so we, re we record all this dirty data in memory. And then periodically, uh, about once every ten, one to 10 seconds, we're going to flush out all the dirty data in the system onto disk. So we might have accumulated like a gigabyte of dirty data, and we're going to go write all of that out. Um, and this process is, uh, is called flushing the transaction group. Um, TXG is an abbreviation for transaction group. And the function that does this is, is spa sync. So you might hear me use these terms, and they're all kind of interchangeable. Um, we're talking about this periodic activity where we're flushing all of the uh, dirty data to disk. Okay, so um, right, so we aren't allocating anything from open context. Uh, it's all in the sync it, when we're syncing things out. Um, so there's, we've accumulated a gigabyte of dirty data, and for each, uh, and that might be like 10,000 blocks. So we have 10,000 blocks that we need to write out. Each one of those, we're going to create an internal data structure called a ZIO um, that is used to track this allocation and the IO associated with it through all of the stages. Um, so there's kind of three main steps to allocation. First, we figure out which device we want to allocate to. And we're doing this for every uh, each of those 10,000 IOs in this example. So you know, the first one comes along, and we say, great, we're, we need to allocate this first block. First, we figure out which device should we write to. Then once we've figured out that, we tell the device, hey, device, please um, allocate this. And the device figure, needs to figure out first which meta slab should we allocate from? And then once we've figured out the meta slab, then it, we ask the meta slab, please allocate this. And it figures out the actual exact offset. 
So, uh, and, and I'll talk some more details about that. But the first stage of that is selecting the device or VDEV. So uh, what is the point of having VDEVs? Like why do we even make the distinction between different devices in ZFS? Um, the reason that we do that is because we have this underlying assumption that VDEVs have more, we, VDEV, we make the assumption that VDEVs have independent performance. So in other words, if I do a write to this device, then um, I can do a write to another device and it won't affect the, the performance of the first write to the other device. Um, but so it's better to, better to keep all my devices busy because that'll give me the best performance than if I wrote them all to one device. Um, and, and this is like more or less true. Um, uh, you know, if you have physical disks backing each VDEV, then obviously if I write to this device, then my other hard drive is, is not involved with that operation. Um, there are other components that are involved, right? They might all be attached to the same HBA, and so you're using up some bandwidth resources there. But by and large, they do have independent performance, at least to a first order approximation. So because of that, uh, we want to spread our allocations across all the devices so that we're, our writes are going to all the different devices um, so that we are using all the devices to perform this uh, high level operation of writing out this gigabyte of dirty data. So to accomplish that, we round robin among all the devices. So we just say allocate the same amount from each of them. And uh, this is like set to 512K. So we say, great, we got a, a gigabyte to allocate. First 512K from this device, next 512K from this device, next 512K here, then go back to the first one. So the end result is that um, if we have three devices and a gigabyte to allocate, we're gonna allocate a third of a gigabyte here, a third here, and a third here. Um, and there's a little bit of an exception here for um, devices that have more or less free space. We'll allocate a little bit more or less there but it's not that much more or less. <coughs> okay, so once we've figured out which device to write to, we need to figure out which meta slab within that device. So um, what is a meta slab? Each device is divided into about 200 um, regions. Uh, each region is the same size, and we call those regions meta slabs. Um, and it's at this level in the meta slab that we track uh, what is actually free and allocated. So um, here we, we have the underlying assumption that sequential writes are better than random writes. Um, and this is also by and large true, uh, even on devices like SSDs, uh, they do, uh, where they're doing remapping under the hood, they, they do actually perform much better if you can give them larger chunks uh, of sequential writes so that they don't have to remap as much stuff, they don't have to do as many, um, uh, they don't have to free as much from their, uh, from the underlying NAND storage. So uh, because of that, uh, we wanna try to stick to one, um, the same one or small number of meta slabs within each device, because that will keep us, keep all of our allocations more or less localized within that device, rather than um, if we were to spread it out over all the meta slabs, that would mean that the writes would be very scattered across the device. So sticking with a small number of meta slabs keeps the writes localized. Um, so the first thing we do is we're gonna find the best meta slab. So the best meta slab we define as the one with the most fragmentation weighted free space. Uh, what does that mean? So uh, it's the most free space. So whichever meta slab has the most free space because we assume that's gonna be like the best one, the easiest one to find um, space to allocate from. Fragmentation weighted means that um, if we have two uh, meta slabs, two regions, that both have the same amount of free space, but one of them, their free space is in bigger chunks, then we're gonna give more weight um, and prefer to allocate from that meta slab. So for example, one meta slab, all of its free spaces in one meg chunks, we're gonna say, that's a great one. Um, but if one has the same, another one has the same amount of space, but they're all in one kilobyte chunks, it's gonna be uh, a lot slower to write there because we're gonna have to spread it out over all these little 1K fragments. Um, and then we're gonna stick with that meta slab. So we wanna stick with the meta slab because otherwise we would just have all the meta slabs with the same, you know, fragmentation weighted free space. We'd allocate a little bit from each of them, decreasing each of them a tiny bit. We'd end up spreading our writes all across the whole uh, device. So we stick with the meta slab that we've chosen uh, until it's more than 70% fragmented. 
Um, and that means that the average free chunk size is around 32 kilobytes. So um, let me give you an example here of uh, what this percent fragmented really means um, and how we calculate the fragmentation weighted free space. So uh, each uh, meta slab is a region of the disk. Um, each meta slab uh, uses this data structure called a space map to keep track of uh, where exactly the free space is within that region. Um, and each uh, of these space maps has a histogram of how big each free chunk is or how many free chunks there are uh, of each size bucket. Um, and this uh, histogram is always loaded in memory. So we have this available when we're trying to decide which meta slab to, uh, to select. Um, so these stars here um, show kind of the histogram visually. And uh, what we've actually recorded on disk is the num chunks column there. So we know, for example, um, we have 50 chunks whose size is about 256 kilobytes. We have 157 chunks whose size is about 128 kilobytes, and so on. Um, so uh, we multiply these first two columns to get this free space. So we know that we have you know, 12 megabytes of free space in chunks of size 256, 200 megabytes of free space in, that are in chunks of size 128. Then we have this fragmentation, like a uh, statically defined hand wavy table that just says, <laughs> Um, uh oh, can you, yeah, you can still hear me. So basically this, this table is just hard coded and it defines like, okay, we're just gonna say that um, if, if the chunks are one kilobyte, that's like totally 100% fragmented. Uh, if the chunks are size 128 kilobytes, that's halfway 50% fragmented. And you know, you know, this table describes the rest of it and, and it gets to 0% fragmented is one megabyte and larger. So uh, we multiply the free space by uh, the inverse of this percent to give us the fragmentation weighted free space. So you know, in the 128, in the 1K chunk, we say, oh, we have two megs of space there, but it's 100% fragmented, so it counts nothing towards our fragmented free space, only zero megs. But you know, here at 128K, we have 200 megs of free space, it counts half, so we count 100 megabytes. So we add up all of these, and it gives us 459 megabytes of fragmentation-weighted free space. Uh, and then that we use that to calculate the um, overall the fragmentation percent for this meta slab. And then uh, the same kind of thing works on the aggregating up to the whole pool level, where uh, we're figuring out you know, the, how, what chunk sizes the free space is in, and then using this table. Uh, the table is basically based on experience, uh, you know, experience of like, if you have one meg free chunks, then performance is like nearly as good as if you had infinity size free chunks. So uh, we'll call that not fragmented at all. And uh, you know, 128K is like, uh, you're still like pretty good, so it's 50% fragmented. Um, obviously, we could have chosen to define this table differently, and it would have meant something different. But this gave us a good kind of spread over reasonable sizes of uh, chunk of free chunks that we see often. Questions about this? Um, the, the fragmentation percentage? Um, no, that's just like uh, heuristical knowledge, yeah. So in other words, you shouldn't actually put too much, so I'm trying to interpret the uh, fragmentation percentage to be too big, so it gives you a lot more than zero. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, uh, the only real literal interpretation is to just go backwards and say like, okay, well, if you're at 70%, then you know, the average free chunk size is 32K. But that, you know, that's only as useful as far as the, like if your distribution is like a normal distribution, if it's like lumpy, then, you know, who knows? Yeah. You can use ZGP to get, like, 
yeah. From the east face map, just trying to get an idea of what's happening. Yeah, so you can use, uh, I'll just repeat it for the recording. You can use ZDB to get a table that looks like this with this, the stars and the histogram of each meta slab or each VDEV that gives you more accurate information. But we wanted to boil it down to just one number that could be compared. We intended it not to be used so much to, to say like, oh, that means my average chunk size is 64K, because like, then, so then what? <laughs> what does that tell me about anything? Um, but more to be used as a relative comparison um, between different pools and so that people could accumulate some kind of institutional knowledge about like, well, on our workloads, we know that like once you hit 70%, that actually means something. It means that the performance is dropping off versus on somebody else could say, well, our workloads are you know, much easier, so we can go to 90% without performance dropping off. But it's a measure of the performance that you should expect of your writes. Okay. So um, great, so now we understand what it means to be 70% fragmented. Um, so why, uh, so now of course everybody knows why we said to stick with it until 70% fragmented, right? Like that totally follows from what I just said. Okay, moving on, uh, no. <laughs> so that 70% fragmented is like also completely arbitrary um, and uh, there's no, there's nothing magical about it and uh, there's kind of some big questions here like what if all of our meta slabs are more than 70% fragmented. Does that mean that we're just gonna be like switching between meta slabs on every allocation or something? Like that, that doesn't sound good. So uh, because of these problems, <laughs> uh, we um, have implemented a new way of doing meta slab selection. Um, and that is uh, rather than starting with the meta slab with the, um, with the lowest, fragmentation with, elite, with the most fragmentation weighted free space. Instead, we're gonna start with the meta slab with the most largest free chunks. So in other words, we're gonna find the meta slab that has the largest class of um, free chunks and then the one that has the most of that size. And we're not gonna work on it until some arbitrary uh, number. We're gonna work on, we're gonna keep using that meta slab until uh, there's another meta slab in the pool that has a free chunk that's four times larger. Um, and this is work from my colleague George Wilson that uh, is going to be posted for review very soon. Uh, so let me give you an example. Uh, let's walk through an example here, uh, which hopefully will help uh, explain this. So um, here I've shown four different meta slabs. In a, and I've shown them uh, ordered in the way that they would be ordered by that metric, so one, two, three, four. Uh, so if we look at which, so what is the largest uh, free chunk? So these two, their largest free chunks is 128K, so that means they come before these ones whose largest free chunks are in the 512K bucket. And then within that, we're gonna look at uh, how many chunks they have of that size. So this one has two chunks of size 128, and this one has one chunk, so this one comes first. So we'll, f we'll first select this meta slab, and then we'll keep allocating from that meta slab. We'll allocate all the 128K chunks, then we'll eat through all the 512K chunks, and then we'll have left, the largest ones will be 256K, and then we'll see, oh, well there's another meta slab in this pool who, that has chunks that are four times larger. So we have 256, and this guy has 128. So we'll, at that point, um, we'll reevaluate, put this one back into the pool and switch to the new uh, best meta slab. So this, um, this method works uh, regardless of kind of how good your devices are, right? So like if all your devices are at 10% fragmentation, it's still gonna select the best one, stick with it for a long time. And like, you know, maybe in that case, your biggest chunk is one meg. You're gonna stick with that, uh, or, or I guess this is one meg. If your biggest chunk is like 128 meg, it might stay there, it's gonna stay there for uh, until you get down to the ones with uh, a quarter meg. Um, or if you have a really, really fragmented pool, maybe they're all 80% fragmented, it's still gonna stick with the, the best one for a little while until there's something better to go off of, rather than arbitrarily saying like, oh, like once you hit 70%, then it's time to do something else. Okay, 
Uh, I'm going to be moving on to a different topic. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. So that gets into um, the policy of like once we've selected this meta slab, how do we select the um, specific offset within it to allocate? Um, so there's actually several different allocation policies that can apply at that level. Um, but most of them um, and the default one uses like a cursor that keeps track of like where did I last allocate? And it's going to prefer to go there if there's still enough free space there. So essentially, we'll like find that one meg chunk, start at the beginning of the one meg chunk, keep allocating until we can't fit the next allocation in the remainder. And then we'll go to the next biggest chunk. So in this case, we'll find another one meg, go through that, and then we'll find the next biggest, which is a 512, and work through that. Uh, yes. And uh, I guess what I was saying is, and the question of switching to a different chunk only happens when you finish that chunk. Other questions on this topic? Cool. Okay, so next I'm gonna be talking about um, a problem with allocation that can occur if you have device, if, if the devices in your pool have different right performance. So how, like, why would that happen? Um, oh, oh. oh, cool. Mm. Okay, so in this pool, uh, we have a whole bunch of mirrors, um, and some of them are bigger than others. And uh, some of them are more, the, the smaller ones happen to be more fragmented. So that means that uh, we can expect, you know, the, the point of the fragmentation metric was to tell us, uh, like, how fast is it going to be to write, to allocate and write to these. So these ones are more, uh, more fragmented, it's going to be slower to write to them. These ones are less fragmented, it's going to be faster to write to them. Um, and you can end up in this situation not just if you've horribly misconfigured your pool with, like, different sizes of devices. But even in uh, you know, normal circumstances, like you, you have all the same size devices, but you added some of them more recently. Well, when you add those devices, they're totally empty, whereas the other ones are probably mostly full. That's why you added the new device. Um, and so writing to the new device is going to go really, really fast because you have huge swaths of free space. Writing to the uh, full devices is going to be much slower because their free space is probably all fragmented. You can even end up with this situation uh, if you've added all the devices at the same time and they're all the same size and they're all from the same manufacturer and they're all the same model, uh, just due to natural variations in um, uh, what you're allocating and freeing, some devices might be slightly, uh, have slightly better uh, free space that we can allocate from than others. Um, and you know, there might only be like a 10, 20% variation there, which is like not that big of a deal, except for the fact that it means that you're leaving that t you're essentially leaving 10 or 20 percent of performance on the table. So uh, remember, I said that when we are selecting which VDEV to allocate from, we just round robin among them, allocate more or less the same amount to each one. So uh, that's kind of what this is showing. So on the x-axis, this is showing the span of time of one transaction group. Uh, and on the y-axis, the number of outstanding IOs. So we start by, uh, we have this one gigabyte of space to allocate. We allocate it evenly among all the devices. That turns out to be like 1,300 IOs to each of these two devices. Uh, one of these devices is fast, so it's able to um, burn down all of its, you know, out, do all of its allocations, do all of the writes to those offsets, and complete it by this time. Meanwhile, the slow device is still working on it, and it takes it all this much longer to actually complete. So that means that during whatever this is, two-thirds of the time, the fast device is just sitting there idle because you know we only allocated the same amount to it as uh, the slow device. Um, so you might see this. Uh, another way of observing this 
is if you use like a zful io stat, you can sometimes catch it uh, writing, but not to all the devices. Uh, and uh, this is sometimes hard to see because oftentimes the time scale of one transaction group is only a, a couple of seconds, and this is only outputting like once per second. Um, so it's easier to see it in the kind of sub-second granularity graph that I showed before. Uh, but you can definitely catch it here sometimes. Uh, and uh, if you see this, then you know you have this problem. So how do we fix this problem? Uh, basically, like, well, we, we know that we are, we've already postulated that these devices are slow and these are fast. So we just want to allocate less to the slow devices and more to the fast devices. Uh, the question is, how much less and how much more? So we want to allocate we want to arrange it so that we're utilizing all of the available write bandwidth. In other words, we're keeping all of the devices busy writing our data uh, all, all the time. So the solution here is to allocate incrementally as we go through the SPA sync. So instead of allocating the whole one gigabyte up front, partially it out to each device evenly, we're, gonna, we're, we're only going to allocate a little bit to begin with. We're going to allocate 100 I, uh, writes to each device. And then as each write completes, we're going to allocate another I.O. to that device that completed the I.O. so that we keep all the devices with 100 um, allocations outstanding all the time. So uh, the end result is that, you know, as you complete more, as you do more work, we give you more work to do. So we keep all the devices busy all the time. And we're going to end up allocating more space from faster devices. Um, and as those fast device, you know, because we're allocating more, they're going to fill up faster, right? But then there'll be a natural balancing where, like, the fast device, as we allocate more stuff from it, is going to get slower because we're going to be filling up more of its space and creating more fragmentation there, and we'll allocate less from it. So um, on real-world workloads, we've seen a doubling of performance based on just this change. Um, so this actually, like, saved us a lot of money from having to buy new storage. <laughs> Question. That number of 100 allocations yeah, that's that's tunable, and um, I, I didn't have a good graph to show it, but uh, because it's keeping 100 uh, allocated to all devices at the same time, you can think of it like. Let me go back here. So uh, you can think of it as like as if we stretch this period where they all have the same number out really really far, right? So. Uh, you have like both lines parallel here, and then one drops off quickly and one drops off slowly. So the, you still have a little bit of time where uh, one device is idle, where the fast device is idle, and that amount of time is, is set by the 100, right? So like I've, I do all my 100 instantly, but this guy takes you know 100 milliseconds to finish his last 100. And so for those 100 milliseconds, this device is idle. So you could turn that down to get kind of better um, even, you know, to have less idleness, and you might want to turn it up if your device is able to um, benefit from having lots of IOs outstanding all at the same time. That's what I was thinking, like an NVMe can be 53 to concurrent. Yeah, so you might want to increase it in that kind of situation. Uh, yes, there was another hand, yeah. Uh, yeah, so y if you had like two <laughs> devices that are empty that and they have different inherent performance characteristics and they're the same size, we're going to be using we're going to write more to the fast device, uh, filling it up faster, uh, and then essentially the uh, we'll end up in the steady state where the fast and the slow devices are different fullness amounts but they both deliver the same um, rate performance. Right? So that the fast one will get really fragmented, but it'll still be as fast as the slow one, be, which is not that fragmented. Does it mean also mean uh, that you will get a little bit uh, worse uh, disk performance? Uh, on your region, because you know that uh, less concurrency of the devices in the um, Potentially. Uh, it, if the devices are kind of like the same, have this, do, do the same thing for reads and writes, like 
like spinning disks, then it's gonna all work out. If they have very different performance for reads versus writes, then there might be some interesting issues there. Uh, excuse me while I hopefully fix my technical difficulties. Was there another question before we move on to the next topic? Um, excellent segue. I will next be talking about on-disk data structures for tracking space allocation. <laughs> so, um, as I mentioned, each, uh, each VDEV is divided into uh, Metaslabs. Uh, the way it works right now, it's divided into about 200 Metaslabs. Uh, and each, the, the point of the Metaslab is to track exactly what space is allocated or free within that region of the disk. So the space map is the on-disk data structure that tracks this. It's a log of allocations and frees. So um, in this example, like at the beginning of time, we assume that the Metaslab is entirely free. Then we allocated this block, which was uh, you know, three sectors, four, five, six, seven, or four sectors. Then we allocated another chunk. Then we freed some, some part of that first allocation. Then we allocated some more stuff. And then there's some unused space. So the next allocation or free will be appended here to the end of the space map. And uh, this space map is uh, an object. It's stored in the MOS. The MOS is a, a object set that stores all the pool-wide metadata. Um, but it's just it's stored within the pool. There's no like special place for it or anything like that. Um, so we just keep on appending to this as we do allocations and freeze to this Metaslab. Uh, but obviously, we can't append forever um, because we would use up all the space in the pool. So uh, you might end up with a situation like this where we've done an allocation, and then we've freed that space. And that might happen many times over where you know, we allocate a, a given uh, place on disk, and then later we free that place, and then we allocate it again, and then we free it again. Um, so Periodically, we condense the space map by writing it out just with the current state. So we're like, okay, we allocated, freed, allocated, freed, allocated. Great, so at the end, it's allocated. We just need to write one allocation entry for that, uh, for that block. Any questions about this? So that, you know, this is the on-disk data structure, but this is not very convenient to, if we wanna know like, is this offset allocated right now so you know, we need, when we're going to allocate, we need to know like, where is the biggest free chunk? Or I what if I allocated here? Is that okay? Is there free space there or is it allocated? So this data structure, um, it tells the information is encoded there, but it is not easy to find it, right? You'd have to like scan the whole thing to figure out where the, if, if what you're looking for is allocated or not. So to allocate, we have to know exactly you know, which parts of the Metaslab are allocatable, in other words, that are free. So to do that, we, um, we load the space map, which means that we read the whole thing from disk, and we, we generate this in-memory data structure called a range tree. So the range tree, um, conceptually, you can think of it like this number line where it's just telling us, like, this range is free, and this range is free, and this range from five to seven is free. Um, so each of these... Uh, circle things is like one entry. Obviously, this could be like, there could be a thousand numbers in there, but it's only a constant amount of space because it just says from five to a thousand. Um, and then uh, we're, we're actually representing that in memory in uh, like a balanced binary tree. Uh, there's actually two of them. One is sorted by uh, offset here. So like zero, three, five increasing offsets. And then another one that's sorted by increasing size uh, so like this one is uh, size four, size one, size one. Um, so what we talked about so far, uh, like a, a meta slab has, is one to one with the space map, which is one to one with this range tree. Um, but conceptually speaking, like the meta slab is the region of space and the kind of code that is in charge of that region of space. The, Space map is the actual on-disk representation of the allocated and free space, and then the range tree 
is the in-memory representation. And we'll get into some examples of where these data structures are used for other things um, later on. Uh, any questions about these data structures? Yes. No. So uh, when so we only uh, need to generate the range tree when we are doing allocations from that meta slab. So uh, normally, uh, so this is another advantage of sticking with one meta slab for a while is that uh, we we load that meta slab, um, meaning you know read it, generate this range tree, and then we're going to do a bunch of allocations from it. That might happen for you know minutes to hours uh, before needing to uh, load another Metaslab from disk. So we can do um, we can do freeze to any Metaslab, whether or not it's loaded, because freeze, you know, they, they're giving us the block and saying, this block I don't need anymore, great. So we can figure out from the offset in the block which Metaslab it is, and then we just append it, append an entry to the end of here that says, oh, this part's now free. Uh, you know, we just trust that it is actually allocated. Versus when we are doing an allocation, we need to know exactly which, reg which regions are allocatable. So we need to load it into the range tree and then we're gonna append alloc entries to the end here. Uh, so how exactly that works. Um, when we are uh, syncing out a transaction group, we keep track of, for, you know, each meta slab keeps track of uh, what allocations, what parts of it have become newly allocated and what parts of it have become newly freed. Um, and we keep track of those in range trees uh, different different range trees, um, and then at the end of the transaction group, we're going to like iterate over each of these range trees and basically convert them into the space map. So, the range, you know, the allocation range tree might say, okay, in this transaction group, you allocated from A to B and then C to D. We're going to go right to the space map. Okay, A to B is now allocated. C to D is now allocated. So, um, this is like hopefully relatively straightforward. But one of the in really interesting aspects of it is the dynamic behavior. So uh, typically, we're doing a lot of freeze every transaction group. Um, and this is true, uh, well, this is not true if all that you're doing is like appending to s some giant files, ingesting a lot of data. But it's very true if you're overwriting any files or freeing any files, then we're gonna be freeing a lot of space. And the freeze, tend to be scattered across all parts of all of the disks, which means that we need to, um, we're, that, which means that we're freeing space from every meta slab typically. So usually every in every transaction group, we're appending to most of the meta slabs. And this can result in a lot of IOs. Um, typically we, can, we see like roughly 600 IOs for each VDEV for each transaction group. Um, 600 is because there's 200 meta slabs in each one of those space maps. We typically have two levels of indirection. So we have the data block of the space map and then two indirect blocks above that that need to be modified. Uh, and then obviously this is assuming that we're just, we're only writing like less than the block size. If we're writing multiple blocks, then uh, you'd have, you know, three data blocks and two indirects or something. Uh, Okay, so that's unfortunately not the end of the problems. Um, so also reading space maps is slow. So you're asking about like, when do we read these data structures from disk? Um, the answer hopefully is rarely, uh, but uh, it can be quite expensive because uh, primarily because the space map block size is only four kilobytes, um, which is really, really small. So uh, you know, we see, I've seen like with the one, even with only a one terabyte VDEV, the space map can be as large as five megabytes, which is over a thousand blocks, which means that when we read in the space map, we have to read a thousand blocks from disk, uh, which could take several seconds. Um, so why is the block size 4K? Well, it's 4K because we're appending to every space map, every transaction group, and if it were larger, we would be writing even more data, right? Because we have to, even if we're only appending one record to the end of the space map, we have to modify that data block. So uh, if we increased it to 128K, 
then we'd be writing 25 megabytes at every transaction group, um, which means like we could end up using like 6% of our bandwidth overhead just for appending these face maps. And you know, the goal here is like, you don't have to think about this ever at all. Allocation is simple and it just works and you don't have to go to a talk that explains why all this stuff is horrible. So 6%, not great. Um, another problem that can occur is uh, that, you know, even though we only have a few meta slabs loaded from each, uh, from, from each VDEV uh, at once, those meta slabs can cover a huge range. So if you have like a 10 terabyte VDEV, which uh, I think very soon will be one single device, but uh, even today, you, you know, you often have this if you have like, let's say you have five uh, two terabyte devices in a RAID Z group, then that's a 10 terabyte VDEV. Uh, so uh, we've seen cases where the range tree uh, of the loaded Metaslab can take you know, up to 300 plus megabytes uh, on a device of this size. And that's based on because we could have like 5 million segments um, in the Metaslab. So then you know, multiply that by your number of devices, you could end up using you know, a huge chunk of your memory for this uh, overhead. So how could we solve this? Um, you know, maybe we should be using a different number of Metaslabs per device. Like right now we're doing 200, but maybe if we had more Metaslabs, then each Metaslab would be smaller, which means that it would use less memory for, uh, you know, for the loaded space maps, and it means that it's smaller, so it would be faster to load it. Uh, because uh, you know it would only cover a smaller region, but then you know on the other hand, maybe we should have fewer meta slabs that are larger because then we wouldn't have to append to as many every transaction group, so we wouldn't have to do as much I/O. Um, and you know maybe the meta slabs maybe rather than having a fixed number of meta slabs, maybe the meta slab size should be fixed so that like as devices grow, we meta slabs don't grow with them. Right? When, we, when we came up with this number 200, this is like uh, over 10 years ago when uh, you know, a big device was like, I think still less than a terabyte. Um, so another thing we could do to improve the performance would be to change the block size that we're using to store the space map. So right now it's four kilobytes, which is really tiny. Um, so maybe we should make that bigger. If we made it bigger, then it would be faster to load it because there would be fewer blocks of the space map. Uh, but then again, like maybe we should keep it small because uh, keeping it small means that we use less bandwidth to write it out when we modify every transaction group. Um, so like making it, having more bigger, more meta slabs with bigger space map sounds really good, except for this problem, this fundamental problem that we keep coming back to, which is that we have to append to most meta slabs, most transaction groups. So yes, go ahead. Um, so, so you're uh, that would be true only if you had never consumed the whole device, right? Like uh, this scenario you're talking about is like essentially, what if some of my meta slabs are totally empty? Then there's nothing to free from them, so I can't be appending to their space maps. Um, so that like that's that is true. But uh, in practice, like most people, like kind of fill up their storage space, and so um, that's like a, a, a nice uh, corner case optimization. But it doesn't really help us in the common case, unfortunately. Yes. Recently written data. Yeah, so. Yes, like, like totally you might end up getting lucky here. Um, and it's certainly true that like things that you allocated recently are most likely to be freed. But the problem is that even if you free just one block from uh, a meta slab, we have to append to it and incur the cost of those like three writes. Um, 
and so like, yeah, like there's, I'm sure there's a, like, a, if you look at the distribution of like freeze per meta slab, like most of the freeze would be going to a small number of meta slabs, but almost all the meta slabs would have at least one free per transaction group. Um, and uh, I will, I, but I will certainly concede that that is not true for every workload. Um, it's, it's definitely true for the workload that you know, happens at my company where we're using databases which have a lot of random, uh, random writes uh, and you know, everybody likes to keep their storage pools as full as possible, keeping you know, old snapshots for forever. But uh, I can certainly imagine other use cases uh, where, where that, this wouldn't happen. In which case, you're great. Don't worry about any of this stuff. Um, was there another hand before I move on to how to address this? Okay, so uh, how do we fix this? So, you know, I was saying we keep running this fundamental problem that we're appending to most space maps and most TXGs. So the solution is let's just not do that. Let's not um, flush the modifications to every meta slab, every TXG. Instead, let's keep, let's just keep track of those in memory and then flush them periodically. So uh, every meta slab will keep track of a range tree that tells us like, here are the allocations that have been performed but haven't yet been written to my space map. And then another range tree of here's this here are the frees that have been performed but not yet written to my space map. Um, so how do we do that? Uh, these, so we wanna keep these, not, these uh, trees not overlapping with one another. So for example, if we allocate a given block and then we free it and then we allocate it again and then we free it again, we don't wanna create multiple entries in here to try and keep track of that. Instead we say like, okay, I allocate it, I put it in the unflushed allox tree. Then if I free it, rather than putting it in the unflushed freeze, I'll remove it from the unflushed allox. That tells me essentially we're keeping track of the delta from what, whatever is on disk in the on disk space map, right? It's saying, I allocated it, great. Now, now I have this allocated that's not on disk. I freed it, okay, great. Well, now there's no change from what's on disk, so I don't need to keep track of that anymore. So uh, now when we load a space map, the, uh, when we load a meta slab, the space map doesn't tell us all of the um, allocation state. So first we have to load the space map and then we need to apply the changes that are in these uh, in memory unflushed allocations and freeze. Um, so once we've done this, then we can say, all right, great. Let's now, let's just flush like about one meta slab per TXG. So the changes eventually will get into uh, the meta, this meta slab space map, but we'll just only come, on, come around. So for a given meta slab, it's only gonna get uh, its changes flushed you know, once every couple hundred transaction groups or something. That way, um, we're gonna have a lot of, when we do flush the changes to the Metaslab meta space map, we're gonna have a lot of changes to do. So we get good efficiency there. Um, we're appending lots of changes to a small number of meta slabs, each transaction group. Um, so what if we crash, right? If we, I, I'm saying we're keeping track of all this stuff in memory. Well, if we crash, um, we're gonna lose all these unflushed allocations and freeze, and then we're gonna get confused about what's really allocated when we uh, open the pool again. Uh, questions before we get, it. This, this is kind of the, the big idea and then we'll get on to how, how to address these, these other problems. But other questions or, or do folks understand what I've explained so far? Let's see, some, 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 at least a little bit of understanding. So, uh, right, so we can't lose these. So the solution to that is um, we're gonna keep track of these unflushed changes in one giant space map. So every VDEV, we're gonna say all, all the changes to all the meta slabs that haven't been flushed, we're just gonna dump them all into one big space map. Um, and then uh, you know, if we crash, well great, we have this log and when we start up again, we can read the, the VDEV's like unflushed log uh, to reconstruct what we had in memory before, which was the each meta slab's unflushed allocations and freeze. Yes. It's getting this down remarkably like journaling. Uh, I mean, it's certainly a similar like it's a similar concept. 
but uh, applied in a different way, uh, you know, t with the different data structures. Other questions? Yes. No, so none of this none of this needs to be involved with the with the zill or logging at all. So everything that I've been talking about here, this is all happening um, like when we're fleshing out the when we're syncing out the changes to one transaction group. So uh, I don't know if, if any of you were here for um, for uh, Kirk's talk this morning about UFS. Um, you know, he, he he talked a bunch about um, uh, you know maintaining consistency by ordering writes. Uh, with, in soft updates, that kind of stuff, which um, fortunately, which which would be very, uh, this kind of scheme that I described would be very difficult um, if we were trying to do that. But thankfully, because ZFS is copy on write, um, all these changes that we're making in one transaction group, we can make like arbitrary changes to any files and any data structures that are interrelated, um, and all of those take effect atomically when we update the, the actual Uber block. Um, this is kind of a fundamental idea of ZFS that this whole batch of changes that we're writing out in one transaction group, um, they all succeed or fail at once. So it's very easy to make um, interrelated changes like uh, where, where we're saying, okay, we're writing out a new block that's from an allocation and we're recording the fact that it was allocated in this other data structure that's in some totally other part of the tree, but they all take effect um, atomically. And the same thing applies with this uh, VDEV space map. Other questions? Okay, so a um, couple of more questions that we might want to uh, look at here. So I said that we, you know, we should just like flush one Metaslab every transaction group so that we uh, eventually they, the data gets flushed and we don't need an unlimited amount of memory. Um, but you know, is one really the right number? Uh, so I thought about like what uh, what do we want to control here? So we want to limit the reconstruction time first of all. So we're, you know we're appending to this per Vita space map uh, log, and uh, we need to read it when we start up. If that takes a really long time, that's going to be bad because it impacts our pool import time. So uh, we want to limit the size of the Vita space map, and. Uh, probably some you know, fixed size, like it shouldn't be more than a gigabyte or something. Uh, then we also want to limit the amount of memory we're using um, by, so we want to limit like the number of segments that we have that are using allocating memory in this, um, <coughs> excuse me, in these unflushed alloc and free trees. So uh, the idea is like every transaction group, we will, flush at least one Metaslab, and then we'll just keep flushing more Metaslabs until we've satisfied these conditions of, you know, the, the VDA space map is below some threshold, and the amount of memory used by the unflushed alloc and free trees is below some threshold. And uh, I, I guess one thing I should say kind of inherent in here is that as we um, are flushing the Metaslabs, uh, we will find that um, the VDA space map, like the older parts of the VDEV space map become totally unneeded, right? So as we, uh, if, if we, like let's say we're flushing one Metaslab per transaction group and there's 200 Metaslabs, we just go round robin, then it means like we, we only need at most 200 transaction groups in the, uh, uh, in the VDEV space map. And stuff that's older than that, we can throw it away. So uh, once we throw it away, we, aren't wasting the space, and also, more importantly, uh, we aren't uh, needing to read that when we uh, start up the system again. So, um, the end result of this is that <coughs> this scheme solves the needing to append to every space map, every TXG. So, because of that, we can increase the number of Metaslabs uh, without any penalty. If we increased it to about one Metaslab per gigabyte of storage, then um, the loaded Metaslabs would use a 50th as much memory, and loading a Metaslab would read uh, a 50th as many blocks. Um, this is an example with a, a 10 terabyte VDEV. And then we can also increase the space map block size to 128K 
which means that loading in Metaslab only needs to read one 32nd as many blocks. And if we do both of these things, then they multiply together. So loading in Metaslab only requires, only needs to read one, uh, what is that, like 5,000th, uh, one, one thousand, one one thousandth as many blocks. Um, and then because we're only appending to two space maps per transaction group, uh, one being the one meta slab that we're flushing and the other being the, uh, the VDEV specific space map, um, we only need to do uh, one one hundredth as many IOs and using one tenth as much uh, bandwidth. Great, perfect. Uh, questions about this? So this, um, this work uh, I have been working on implementing, uh, it still needs a little bit more uh, work before it is integrated, uh, but this is, this is coming. Yes? Um, more like a year. So the other two changes that I mentioned, those are both gonna be out for review soon, so that's, I would say, like weeks to a month. This is gonna be, uh, you know, come back next year, hopefully we'll be able to say this, that this is integrated. Other questions? So I have one more thing. Oh, did you have a question? Yeah, so uh, I've actually implemented basically everything except for this last slide of like figuring out how many to flush per transaction group. Um, and yeah, we've, we've seen really good improvements here. Um, this, this stuff pretty much all pans out as theorized because it's like, it's very basic and theoretical. Like if you have fewer of these things and there's few, you know, if, if they're smaller, then there's less stuff in each of them. Um, what we have yet to do is measure like uh, under a real world workload like how much, uh, how much actual bottom line performance do you win, right? Like obviously the overhead here is gonna be much less, but how much does that matter on a real world workload? You know, I, um, based on measurements that I've seen before, I think this is gonna be on the order of like 10%, maybe 20% in the extreme cases, uh, but that's, that's the kind of order magnitude improvement we're talking about. Not, unfortunately not the like, twice as fast kind of stuff that we saw with where we were just like letting disks sit idle. So I have one more announcement to make, which is the uh, OpenZFS Developer Summit Conference. Um, so this is a conference that we hold uh, every year. This is gonna be the fourth year that we've done it. Uh, it's gonna be this year, September 26th and 27th. Uh, that's a Monday, Tuesday, just like last year, last previous years. It's gonna be in San Francisco, just like previous years. Uh, as with previous years, the first day will be um, talks. The second day will be hackathon, where you have a chance to like work with folks who um, maybe you don't see every day. Uh, this is primarily for uh, developers, folks who are working with the ZFS code base. Uh, we have pretty limited space, um, but registration is now open. So uh, please, uh, if you're interested, grab some of that limited space uh, because we, anticipate selling out. Um, we have not increased the size of the conference since last year. Uh, so uh, we wanted to keep this small, you know, small intimate feel where there can be discussions. Um, right now, uh, we're primarily looking for folks to submit talks and also for companies that are interested in sponsoring the conference. Um, and we have two, uh, early sponsors, uh, Delphix and Intel, who I'd like to thank. Um, so I hope to see some of you there, uh, and I hope to hear from some of you uh, with talks. Send me email. Um, we're looking for just very short uh, proposals of what you'd like to talk about. Thank you.